having a challenge with our consular services in other areas of the country are things which have to be done by parliament. We have over 3,000 items to export free to the United States. How much have we tried it? To, to create informal sector, 85% of our small businesses are informal. If you just do 15% out of that, the revenue generation you generate of the country is a lot. This Biden administration, there's a big push for what is called women and youth empowerment. I, I just want to take a quick uh, mention talk. Okay. Um, I want to sincerely acknowledge Ms. Richard for your hospitality and welcoming me. I just want to mention you that Quito, it is, I started the Quito when Quito started in 2015. I joined the embassy in August 2015, and I think I was their first guest, first guest in Gaithersburg in 2016. So I have been with you on this journey, and I've been always supportive of you guys in the whole way coming up. I want to acknowledge uh, the key speakers, uh, Abi Mongombe, and Moai, and Josh Shege, and Andrew Gitam. I want to acknowledge the Quito team, Eva, Susan, Terry, and Mombi, and all the noble sponsors that I have mentioned for now. Uh, I just want to assure the, the businesses teams that are coming from Kenya, there is enough business in the diaspora for everyone. And I think when you come together this way, I think it's very, very noble of you to come and support our Kenya diaspora. Uh, <clears throat> this has reflected very well uh, in our company for the last the six years we have been in the Kenyan Embassy, we have supported uh, our country and our presence in the United States government has been very vibrant in the last, I would say for the last seven years, between the Trump administration and, and Biden administration. And I think that's fundamental because of our hardworking people. We are resilient, we are hardworking Kenyans. It's testament to the people who have come from Kenya to sell business to us. This is very unique to us our country, and it's something we should be very proud of. So I'm very proud of the team that have come from Kenya to sell their business here and to help us in the diaspora to leverage our expert or their resources in this country. I want to sincerely now pass my greetings from my head of mission, Ambassador Sanamayo, he could make it. We had conflicting programs in Minnesota, he's there right now, and he said his own regrets, and he told me that let you know that he's with you, and I'm here with my colleague from the American Embassy, uh, Kenyan Embassy, uh, Karo Tenko. Karo, you want to stand up? Sure. <laughs> Karo is our administrative secretary for Balozi in, in Kenya, and we are here to, here to present Balozi together with us. So I want to give you the status of our services so far. As all of you are known, by, by Tuesday next week we'll be having elections. So in the next few weeks we'll be having new administration in uh, Kenyan Embassy. I mean, in the Kenyan government, and of course, we'll be having some changes in, in there after, but at this point, so far, so good. Uh, we just want to let you know that we all pray for a peaceful elections. We hope whatever we push the elections cause, we have a peaceful elections, and we have an opportunity to, to showcase the world of the global space, the democratic space our country has developed, and where we are in Sub Saharan Africa, in light of, of democracy challenges that has happened in Sub Saharan Africa. And Kenya is out there, shining out there. And we believe that so far so good. This is the best elections we have had without any violence up to this point. Uh, today was last, Saturday was the last day of the elections. And I can assure you that everything was smoothly. And it's my sincere hope, and it's our sincere hope that the election will be a peaceful election. Um, Balozi is, con is right now concentrating on uh, uh, what is we are calling it, uh, uh, an aggressive outreach programs where we are trying to reach out to the diaspora. In that capacity, we are trying to reach out to the diaspora with uh, accompanied by services. And someone might ask us why we are not able to do the services this time. But th there was a conflict of programs coming up. I have reached out to all the sponsors in here today and I've asked them to work with us. So whenever they sponsor Quito or any other organization out there to come with the embassy, because we can corroborate where we can bring uh, consular services to you in such kind of program. So in, we are hoping that in future, when, when you have quit on the, whatever you're going to have in the country, we have organized ourselves. I have given my contact to all the, 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 the sponsors today, and we have agreed 
their next, when they come up to sponsor this program, they bring the embassy with them. And with us, we bring the services with them. Right now, we have, we have, we have, uh, we, we have some challenges in our services, but we are working to fix them. We had uh, events in, in, a, in, a, in a Dallas, Texas. Uh, on equal measures, we had criticism, we have, you know, high, uh, good feedback. We served 600 people. These are people we saved money from traveling to Washington, D.C. We feel those are things that will come, come out. Minnesota right now, we are doing, we are so far, 300 people we have served. So we feel, we, we, if we do this outreach and we work with the U.S. and the Kenyan uh, corporate sector, we can also do more work if we can collaborate with them. Um, we... We, we, I'm, I'll reach out to you, uh, Esquito, and uh, there's something that I didn't want to talk to you because you touched a lot. Um, I want to touch a little bit about on what is, I want to consider what is all the contingency of the existence of Quito itself. What does it mean for the of Quito? I, my, I really want to consider that because in this administration, this Biden administration, there's a big push for what is called women and youth empowerment. Okay, in that women and youth empowerment, there's a lot of resources that you, women, Kenyan women who are in the United States, most of them are, most of you are US citizens also. There are resources within you, within the law, that you can leverage on under Kwitu chapter, that you can build to develop our country. So right now we have, we have the USAID have, uh, there's one particular program that, and I'm gonna share it with, uh, with, with Lily when I live here. It's called KIM. It's called um, Kenya Investment Mechanism. It's a five year USAID project that is facilitating $520 million uh, investment in key sectors of Kenya's economy, including agriculture, regional trade and investment opportunities, and the Prosper Africa Initiative. The project supports mobilization of private investment and accelerate enterprise driven development. KIM uses smart incentives to mobilize finance for development in targeted sectors, including agriculture, uh, energy, infrastructure, and women owned businesses, as well as in health, wash, and trading sectors. There is a big initiative, and uh, I didn't want you to, to, to hear me on this one. There's a big initiative by this administration of what is called inequality. If you hear the word build back better, the underlying factor is inequality. And there is no better population to push this kind of inequality than women and youth. This is one sector I feel that we can collaborate with you and members. We can guide you. There's a lot of money being forwarded for projects in Kenya or any other African countries, but you find these projects are being undertaken by US companies based here. There is no reason why, if you are citizens of this country and you are citizens of Kenya, you cannot undertake these projects. And most of them are projects that we can shine out there. Projects like climate change and adaptations, we are the best, we actually are better than even United States in terms of climate adaptation. 90% of our energies are renewables. We shine out there. And there is no reason why you cannot participate that in the world. The best way to participate is the understanding that 80% of our businesses are informal. And 61% of our informal sector is women business. So Lily was right. Women down there, we're not doing anything. We're not as much involved in business as men. And if there is any change in our inequality in our society, because we can be as much rich as we want, you can leave that rule and that is what drives you to, to your remittance. You can be so developed out there, but if there are poor people behind you, it will never be enough. You will never be satisfied. You can be doing so well, but in the back of your mind, you know there's somebody who knows who is very poor, and there is nothing to do about that. So the best way to fight inequality in ourselves is also fight it in terms of development. And this is where we can work with the embassy, we can introduce some of these programs that USID is doing in Kenya. Let me tell you, if a USID company based in the US is doing a project in Africa, only 20% of that money goes to the local country. Okay? 80% of that money goes back to the university fee. 
But you, if you are a Kenyan, and this is really the law, you are not doing it out of the law. As a Kenyan diaspora working here, and if you, if you think 80% that money is coming back to Kenya diaspora, who is working here, who is an American citizen, that money eventually through remittance will go back to Kenya. So this is, these are things we can do, and these are the things you see countries, believe it or not, countries like China and all those countries, Singapore, their diaspora is the one that drives the economy where they are. And there's no reason why we can't do that. And we build on that. The other issue I wanted to, to let you know is um, there's this issue of free trade agreement. And I really want to ask the diaspora to understand this. Because we get beaten a lot because they say, why are you doing bilateral trade agreement in the United States? Are you forgetting after the continent of free trade area? Are you not considering other countries what you do it in East Africa? But where we are in Kenya right now, in terms of financial regulations, in terms of uh, digital, in, term, in terms of technology, we are a little, bit, a little bit higher than other African countries. The most important one is financial regulations. Kenya is the only country in Africa right now. You can put in $50,000 tomorrow, and you can take that money out three days later. You can't do that, even in the best economy that is South Africa, you can't do that. That's a guarantee. That's a niche we have. So in any, if you look at those countries that we were in the same GDP in the 70s, you know, that we should always come back. South Korea, Vietnam, Singapore. Okay. The one overriding factor that they did in those countries to be where they are in developed countries right now is purposefully developing a bilateral relationship with the United States. And I want to give you a good example of this. When you talk of AGOA, you hear of the Cultural Opportunity Act, which was set up in 2000. You, talk, you hear about, we have over 3,000 items to export free to the United States. From Sub-Saharan Africa, 36 countries right now in Sub-Saharan Africa are qualified for AGOA. How much have you tried it? Other than the extracts, the, the oil from Nigeria, the oil from Angola, if you take that out, we don't do more than $500 million a year. And three quarters of that actually comes from Kenya, from textiles. And if that would come from Kenya textile, 80% of yarn used for making that textile come from Asia. So what, we, what I really want you, we as embassy, want you to understand and to support us when we talk about bilateral trade agreement with Kenya, we are setting up a template for other African countries to use. Okay. I will, take a thing, I will take a very good example in agriculture. Right now, is we bring the best coffee here, we bring it raw in bags. What is our biggest challenge? Quality, consistency of quality and quantity. So you have a good guy in, in, in Nebraska, he brings good coffee, six months he brings very good coffee, the six months he can't get the right coffee from Kenya. You don't bring the courses, that's a problem. Uh, so when you have, when you, when you synchronize, and this is really very important, to, I want you to understand this. When you synchronize your standards with a superior economy like the United States, even the Chinese, that's how they are where they are. We synchronize our standards in agriculture, okay? The way we manage our coffee from the time of harvest, the way we prepare it, the way we roast it, the way we package it, the way we set it out, we synchronize with the U.S. standards. So anybody who in the United States who knows Kenya and U.S. have bilateral trade agreements, they have agreed on standards and policies on both ends. If you have that, you don't even, with the United States, even the Europeans themselves, they'll come to you. Because right now, as soon as, as soon as you roast coffee in Kenya right now, you are adding another variable. You cannot export that coffee to the United States because you have changed the rules. Because there are no standards registered that. The other thing that comes in is what is called intellectual property. You almost should be almost should be a, 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 a lawyer. If you don't synchronize, we might have the best policies of intellectual property policies and regulations, but we don't implement them. But you have to you have to synchronize them with a superior partner like United States, such that if the first question, if you talk to Google here, you've got big corporations here, the first question they'll ask, do we have a bilateral with Kenya? 
That's the first question. If the first question, I remember the first question I had with Walmart. Do you have a laptop in Kenya? No. So these are the things I would like you as, as people in the dust and to go and learn. And you, you, these things are open. You go to USTR website in the Kenya Embassy. You see all those. Right now, Biden and administration from the meeting the pre our president had in October last year, we actually we think we're going to go back to resume the, 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 uh, the bilateral trade agreement with the United, with the United States. We start in September, that's in three months from now. We need your support in the diaspora because there is a very strong NGO system in this country sometimes that really fights us getting those privileges. Because the moment Kenya is able to have a bilateral trade agreement with the United States, a lot of these NGOs will have no jobs in Africa. And we need to build that because there is no way that enough escape velocity from poverty is bilateral trade agreements. And you look those countries, we have done that, Singapore. I'll give you a good example. In 2000, we did a goal. In 2000, Vietnam. Vietnam was poorer than Kenya by far. Vietnam in 2000. But Vietnam right now is doing 15 to 20 billion dollars of textile to the United States. On our own. Not the 54 countries of Africa. Because of that, things that we need to, as you as diaspora, will build on. And the last time we had a meeting with them, uh, of course I can't divulge a lot of things on the trade, we met them in Naivasha last week, there was an issue they brought in about women and youth problem. And this is where you guys come in. And, and really, I didn't want us to work on this one. Because this is something you can be resilient with your teams. Okay, what, when you're talking about people, laxity of some membership coming out, uh, I think the way, of, the way you do things every day the same way, I think it's good for Quito to be diversifying. You have a lot of brilliant teams. Yesterday I had you have brought up doctors and all that. You have other people who are scientists in their own field. Let's, let's work together. We will, we will introduce you to these groups that can help you diversify your entity as Quito. Leverage, leverage on that skill set that you have. You have so much diverse skill set here. There are people here who can develop a healthcare program that they can take it back to Kenya. There's no reason why we can't do that, when we can do it. And we're using the U.S. by law, not anything legal, but by law. We can use U.S. resources because most of you are U.S. citizens. You can do that. And we can work together to leverage that money. If you get part of that U.S. money that goes to Kenya, $501 billion a year, most of the funders, they have no capacity to absorb those funding. Because some of these organizations in Kenya don't have the capacity to absorb this funding. You can actually work on helping companies in Kenya absorb this funding in healthcare, in education, in women and youth. One of the challenges when, we, when they came to ask us about women and youth, they were shocked to find how many programs are there on women and youth, but have no funding. But the problem is that they don't have the capacity to absorb this funding. This is where you can come in. There are so many women and youth program, empowerment program, to to, to, to create informal sector, 85% of our small businesses are informal. If you just do 15% out of that, the revenue generation you generate of the country is a lot. And these are areas that some of your members, sectors can come in and work. And we can work this out. We can even do a seminar in an embassy where we bring you and we bring USID. In different areas, we have energy, infrastructure, healthcare, and other areas that can come. And I'm very sure, you know, I had, you know, when I hear when we was talking here, there is so much potential that we have, we can deliver this. But this is our time. But I'm very sure that if we do this bilateral trade agreement with the United States, and we have people like you in this country, our country will never be the same. But we can never be comfortable if inequality in the country stays this way they are. We have to have the economy. So um, I just wanted to push on that and uh, uh, bring in something that uh, I didn't. Would like you to understand is during COVID 2019, 2020, and 2021, every month we are sending home our youth on suicide mission. Every month we are signing a certificate, sending a child home. If we have mental situation in our youth in this country, and for me, the most fundamental thing I feel is a problem is identity crisis. 
And one of the biggest problems I have in crisis is we have forgotten our language. Okay? We grow our children here, we don't teach them our own language. I am a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm to blame on that. I grew my children here. I didn't speak my language. I am blamed to that. These kids, by the time they go to school, they are not in English. They are not. They are African American. They are Kenyans. They don't know where they belong. They have identity. It's continued on and on and on. We have to be proud of our own culture. If you look at Indians or Chinese, a Chinese or Indian child, the first language he learns is Hindu or Chinese. Before they go to school, they learn their own language. We have forgotten that. We have forgotten that. It's not fashionable to speak your own language, but that's a challenge. Because that, it catches up with that child at some point in life. They have identity issues. Who they are, where they belong, they are not proud of their language. And this is something that is a real big problem, and I know you, there was a panel yesterday discussion about that. But it's something that we really think, and I remember in 2019 we were uh, inaugurating uh, Gogo to Rai Brado Congress. And this is one of the things he told me, that Gashiro, our challenge is when somebody takes away your language, they destroy your culture. You don't have your language, you have no culture. And that's why we find ourselves so much messed up with social media, you know, we sucked up with WhatsApp, we stock up with false media, we have no identity. It's a challenge for our youth. And we, we need to sit down in, in our own real thoughts. And the, when you are asleep and you are your own, you're in the bed, go back in that mind of yours and see why, what's the problem we have to do. It's something we need to have to talk about that. Why are we losing so many of our young people at the tender age of the teenage life in this country? And you see that is repeated all the other African cultures. It's repeated everywhere. But the most of anything is that lack of culture of language. So I just want to touch that a little bit of that, and uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, I had asked really if it is okay, if there's any burning question that you feel you want to ask about the embassy, uh, of the services that we provide to you. Uh, we, we just want to let you know that we are there to do the services, but I also want to let you know that you also have an obligation to, as you do these programs, identify people in our parliament because some of the things we are having a challenge with of consular services in other areas of the country are things which have been done by parliament. They are ingrained in our constitution that we have these other things have been approved. Anything that needs to be managed in the constitution that has been amended, it has been done by parliament. So in a meeting like this, and we can work with Lily and the team, your team that's coming up, we invite the chairmen of foreign relations committee in this, to this place. We start lobbying your own parliament. We have to work together as a diaspora. We have to identify that we have to also lobby. Even here, we have to lobby our own congressman. You know the local congressman here in this town, who you think, look at the congressman in your area here, who, have, who are members of a certain committee. Appropriation committee is big. Labor is big. Okay? There's one program I would like you to, to read about. It's called H2A and H2B. Okay, we, this year we're going to try to see whether we can get Congress to certify Kenya as one of them. H2A and H2B are agricultural certification programs. Right now, there are no labor people for agriculture in Central America. In Iowa, all places are agriculture. And the only country that certified for H2A and H2B is South Africa. Those are some of the things. The other things we can do is also, if you know Congressman who is on the health committee, we start pushing for H2 in healthcare. This is one area we are so good at. Because we can also start supplying healthcare jobs in this country in terms of a nurse assistant, nurses aid, healthcare staff, healthcare aid, non-professional, non-nursing health programs that we can also assist. But this is an area we can try to work with Congress. So even you here, whenever you are, people from Seattle here, Find out, know your congressman, and know which committee they are in. And in a meeting like this, invite them. To come here. They'll be very happy to come. And you let them know your issues that you're dealing with. So when they come here, they also understand that. So we need to work together. We need to just diversify things so that we don't do the same thing every day. People get bored. 
can you get by? Let's, let's diversify the things we do. We grow our country. We have the potential to grow our country. Our country is great. And I think we have an opportunity to grow our country and diversify ourselves. So with that, I just want to uh, over to you, 